is Judd Devermont. I am the director of the Africa program here at the Center for Strategic Studies, and it is my honor, in partnership with the Wilson Center, to welcome you to our event today, Navigating China and the United States, a conversation with Prime Minister Korea Isilva. Prime Minister Korea Isilva has an inspiring story to share today. His country, Cape Verde, has one of the strongest democratic records in sub-Saharan Africa. Since the transition to multi-party democracy in the 1990s, his country has received high marks for his protection of political rights and civil liberties. In fact, Freedom House has not only rated Cabo Verde free, but it consistently gets the highest scores across the region, 90 out of 100. When Prime Minister uh, Correa de Silva became the head of government in 2016, he also marked another important accomplishment. It was the third time there was an alteration of power between his party and the opponent political party. Um, this is truly a remarkable feat that Cabo Verde continues to have this alteration of power where uh, there's a peaceful transition between one party to the other. Today we want to do two things. First, we want to provide an opportunity for the Prime Minister to share his vision for his country. Next month he's going to mark his third year in power and I think it's fitting for him to share his assessment of the progress so far under his leadership and also to preview what he'd like to accomplish going forward. Second, we want to have a conversation here about a topic that continues to be uh, the rage in Washington, D.C., great power competition. Cabo Verde has close relations with the United States, but also with the European Union and with China. We want to hear from the Prime Minister about how the framework of strategic com competition works in practice in his country. Specifically, how does his government balance these relationships? How does he ensure that he gets the most advantageous and beneficial deal for the Cabo Verdeans when he talks about commercial and security ties with Washington, Beijing, and Brussels? Finally, I'm eager to hear from him about his government, what his government would like to see from the international community. What is productive and what is counterproductive uh, for his country as he navigates these bilateral relationships? And with that, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Prime Minister Correa Silva to CSIS. to CSIES. Thank you for the invitation, Jud. And the I will send center all of uh, these uh, participants in this event. I'm going to do my statement and the interview in Portuguese. Uh, that's why the translation is uh, available and you can use it. Thank you. Eu gostaria de apresentar. I would like to thank you for being here. And first, I would like to introduce Cape Verde. It's a small country. It's, it has a small market. We are, we are located between Africa, Europe, and Americas. We are a group of small islands. We also in a maritime route between Brazil and Guinea. A strategic goal is to make Cape Verde an important country in the Atlantic, both in economy, security, and democracy. We also like to promote democracy. This is an important goal because we need to understand our options strategic options in terms of foreign policy. We 
we start with the premises. First of all, Cape Verde as it is, a small group of islands with geostrategic position, and we also like to, to, to give value to our goods. As a small country, Cape Verde needs to have economic space, and it needs to be dynamic. We need to give access to investment in market, technology, knowledge, security, so we can speed economic growth and export and also reduce uh, external vulnerability. And how this is done? We're doing it by producing goods and transactional services. We also like to, to promote tourism, maritime and air transportation, and other specialized services. We support it by innovation and knowledge. This is our strategic option, and it's fundamental. We are a country that lived for so many years under impact of a foreign debt. And this change, any change with the investment in commerce and economy. We attract the new sources for knowledge, technology. And that's how Cape Verde is changing its relationship with the world. Cape Verde has so many favorable factors to be inserted in the economic system all over the world. As we say, we are a country without mineral resources. And we don't have any other resource, only human capital. And we are qualifying human resources with education, knowledge, and increasing the capability of social intervention. We also would like to, to give value for the country's uh, history. We have over five centuries of histories. We have our own identity. We have our own culture. This is open to the world. And we are, our culture is spread all over the world, it's particularly in the United States. But our strategy goes through a uh, location because we are connected between Africa, America, and Europe. We also like to give, talk about our political stability, economic stability, social stability, and we can trust, our investors can trust in us. Based on all those values and those resources, they're all interconnected. And that's how we like to, to put Cape Verde as a platform between Africa to facilitate activities such as tourism, air transportation, ports, commerce, investment, digital economy, and financial services in order to promote Cape Verde in security cooperation in maritime and also to fight for transnational crime. Again, talk about localization. Cape Verde is in between Brazil and go all the way to Guinea Gulf. And talk about security of a country and the future security of our own country. So the broader economic zone that goes way beyond um, our size is even bigger than Texas. Our maritime, ter maritime dimension is bigger than ter Texas. That's why it's fundamental that we can assure that this path is secure and it will promote security of our own country. And last, we also like the Cape Verde will be considered a country that is stable. This is a greater good 
political stability, social stability, and institutional stability. You can trust in relationship between bilateral relationship that's based in, co in consistency of the relationship and also democratic values, freedom values, respect human rights, trust relationship between investors with strong institutions, a strong judiciary system, economic freedom, transparency, fight against corruption, and we can trust in our economic and financial institutions. And one more time, I would like to point out a geoeconomic location, not only for economy, but also for security reasons. Based on all those factors and all those options, that's how we determine some priorities between our relationship between foreign policies. The EU, as an economic, scientific e connection that is close to Cape Verde, not only in location, but also intensity between the relationship and, and commercial relationship, investment in tourism, over 80% of a Cape Verde commerce is done with Europe. Over 80% of investments also comes from Europe. And over 90% of tourism also comes from Europe. This is reality. And Cape Verde is interested in developing this, even though we would like to diversify a relationship. Another great uh, partner, United States of America. Cape Verde has old relationship, historical relationship, where we have the greater diaspora that is located in the Massachusetts. And a priority is to have United States as a security ally and also have Cape Verde participate in collective security, maritime security, and fight transnational crime. And finally, what connects Europe, Africa, and United States is the, the community of uh, Western Africa. This is a space of economic integration and a space for market. So, Cape Verde can circulate its own economy, and this is a market for over 3 million inhabitants. And all those people are also consumers. And that's how a strategy to develop our foreign relations, all decisions that are bilateral and multilateral with all those countries all over the world. Thank you very much. I understand. Okay. I can understand when. Okay, great. <laughs> then I will take uh, this off. Um, we wanted to spend this conversation between you and I uh, thinking a little bit about your, your partners. Um, can you talk a little bit, you talked in your speech a little bit about your partnership with the United States and with uh, the European Union, but maybe you could expand on the kind of partnerships that you think that you can have here with the United States, the partnerships that you want to deepen with the European Union, and then if we could introduce your relationship with China and how you think about that relationship. In regards to the United States of America, we have a particular interest. We would like to work in an agreement for security and defense. In particular, uh, to protect a maritime zone. This is in consequence of the SOFA agreement, agreement that we signed in September 2017, and a common interest that so we can participate in a system of cooperation, participation to secure this zone. The the maritime corridor between Brazil and New Guinea. 
We also have concluded a strategic document that has elabor been elaborated with the support of the United States of America so we can proceed with this agreement. Another program that we have in the United States is a free trade agreement between the United States and Cape Verde. This is very important to us because it assures a quality that can assure us to improve a quality and quantity of investment between Cape Verde and the rest of the world. And finally, economic cooperation. We have uh, a lot of Cape Verdeans living in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. And that's why we like to develop a relationship not only in the city level, but also in state level. And I think this is very interesting. In regard to the European Union, as we said, this is a great reference. We have a connection between the Cape Verde and the Scudo with the EU. We packed the currency since 2008 with the euro. This allowed Cape Verde to have a, a reduction in, in foreign currency risks. This is how this is how Europe invested more in Cape Verde. Besides that, we have a strategic partnership that allows Cape Verde to have um, a relationship between you um, done in an easier way. We have Cape Verdeans that still have a restricted mobility to Europe. But recently, uh, since January 1st of this year, these allow Cape Verde to have an initiative. So Cape Verdeans that can go to Europe without the need of visa, and uh, Europeans can come to our country without need of visa. And this allows us to go to, to travel and also to study in Europe. So we don't have any sort of restriction of visa. And also to eliminate the administrative barrier in this common space. Well, as per China, China is an old partner. He has been a partner since independence in 1975. It's basically operating and developing programs in sectors like education, infrastructure. We have the intention to keep and maintain this cooperation within a framework of a, a very previsible, very actually anticipated framework. And we have all the foreign diplomats in Cape Verde, and we have very clear orientation. Our security, our favored security partner is the U.S. Uh, in terms of economic relations, it's the European Union. Our, in terms of uh, development, economic development, according our favorite partner is China. But we have bilateral relations with most European countries and special relations with countries where we have uh, a large contingent of uh, Cape Verdeans. So we have security and defense, which in this regard, the priority is obviously our U.S. alliance. framework that you've thought about in terms of diversifying a security partnership with the U.S., uh, economic trade and investment partnership with the European Union, and an economic development partnership with China. Maybe we can be a little uh, undiplomatic, and are there things that you'd like to see more from those partners, or maybe I'll put it another way, are there weaknesses with those partnerships that you'd like to address? I'm going to mention the advantages, the fact that we have a very clear and 
easily anticipated results. Cape Verde knows what it wants. The partners know, know, they all know what to expect. It's all defined. It's all documented in our uh, foreign policy. And uh, we have uh, our relations based on trust. Our relations are based on trust uh, on its partners. And uh, the fact that we are a small island country with a vast di diaspora, we are not a superpower, we're not a threat. So Cape Verde can easily establish relations with any country in the world. One of the countries we are actually have developed very strong relationship is with Israel. Very clear the day when I took office as prime minister, we said in our statement that Israel would be our strategic partner. And uh, it's actually happening now. Um, this option is actually taking place. And uh, with regards to the disadvantages or weaknesses, we were unable to identify them, but we may uh, consider eventual risks that can actually shake some of the relations. Particularly since Ambassador Bolton's speech in December, there's a, you know, a lot of conversation about competition with China between the US and um, criticisms about China's role in sub-Saharan Africa. And so I think this is an incredible privilege to have you here to talk about, from an African perspective, how do you think about mitigating some of the negative effects of Chinese engagement? I mean, do you, thinking about labor or environmental degradation, labor practices, environmental degradation, China has a, doesn't hold much debt for you, but you know, how do you think about these issues? How do you mitigate them so that you get the best deal for Cabo Verde? First and foremost, our laws actually cover everyone, including uh, the foreigners who work with us. And uh, thanks to our legislation, we, we have discovered on trade, economic activities, and, uh, and even illegal activities that can actually take place in Cape Verde. And we try to set up a legal framework that actually aims to protect the country and its economy from uh, situations that would be less than legitimate in their business. So its application is actually differentiated regardless with the country. And there is another interesting issue. Cape Verde is a country that actually follows rules, our relations with entities that are in charge of uh, financial regulations, such as the IMF. So that's why we don't have excessive debt vis-a-vis -vis other countries. Our debt is only with international financial institutions, the World Bank, the African Bank for Development. We don't intend to get into greater debt in bilateral relations with countries that could lead to sovereignty issues, etc. So this is also very clear and well known in Cape Verde. We actually have established that in a very clear way. We have special care in not getting indebted with other agencies that are not financial institutions. Said in, in writings that I have done is that it is not very useful to be critical of what China is doing in Africa, but rather to be helpful uh, to African governments in terms of negotiation with China. So instead of posing it necessarily as a competitor, posing as uh, an advocate for African partners. And um, it would be wonderful to hear from your perspective, is there more that the United States can do to help you advance your goals and then when you're negotiating uh, with China, the European Union, or, or other countries that the U.S. can do to ensure that the deals are the best for your country? 
With this regard, we are extremely interested in great, um, achieving capacity building, especially in negotiations on foreign trade. We have already our framework in place, but the stronger the capacity is, the better it is. But we don't have any trade agreement with China that actually links uh, Cape Verde uh, to have uh, more favorable or less favorable relations with China. Our trade with China is actually very diminutive, is actually not significant. 80% uh, of our trade is with Europe. What, what we have with China is support in infrastructure building and some trade, but very small level of trade. So anything we can develop to improve the situation uh, with the legislation and uh, surveillance and monitoring, we are extremely interested in taking. Uh, obviously, we are an open economy, and uh, we we work in the free market. Uh, framework, and we have the ability to actually intervene that obviously it can improve, and I would like to actually improve our trade relations with the U.S. Well, comment, uh, thinking about capacity building for negotiations and how uh, international partners can be helpful. Uh, just one last question, and then we'll open it up for the group. Are there things that the, thinking again about great power competition and the rhetoric around it, are there things that uh, the U.S. Um, can do that may be counterproductive? I mean, what, how do you think about this, the rhetoric around this strategic competition? How, how do we make sure that it is not disadvantaging or counterproductive? So, so, so some, at one with regards to the current scenario, according to the, we don't have any any immediate consequence or visible consequences regarding the current uh, policy of the U.S. vis-a-vis -vis Cape Verde. We are all integrated. We have positive relations, and we want to strengthen those relations because it has to be an open type of relationship. And whenever situations like um, uh, commercial problems, then a, a small country like Cape Verde can be affected, like trade wars, for instance. And But we are optimists, and we hope that all the so-called, quote, unquote, trade wars would be solved. Uh, we have uh, the great powers working for the economy of the world to work well, and that could benefit a country like Cape Verde. But with regards to the U.S., I would like to reaffirm that we have very special and positive relationship, and a large segment of the population of Cape Verde is located in the U.S., and we want to strengthen and deepen ties with the U.S. so that Cape Verde becomes much more uh, recognized in the United States. I don't. I don't think that we could have this conversation if it wasn't with such a good partner, uh, with a with a country like in your government that we have such good ties on that we could ask you to ask these questions, which are a little are, are difficult. And so I, I really appreciate that. With the remainder of our time, I'd like to open up uh, for questions. So I see a, a hand right there, and then we can go there and there. Um, this, sir. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Excellency, my name is uh, Ni Akwete. I am an immigrant from Ghana, but I have lived in Washington for decades. I cover all the issues between the US and uh, Africa. Um, two weeks ago, the cover of The Economist was on what they call the new scramble for Africa. And while they talk about other places, they, they focused on China. And I actually teased Judd that they should have put his name on the cover because they picked up a lot of his ideas 
in that article. But the economist advised Africans that one of the things they can do with regard to negotiating with China is to negotiate as a group instead of as one among 55 countries. So my question to you is sort of a suggestion also, would you consider raising this issue in the Africa Union that we should find a way to negotiate with China and even with the Europeans and others as a group rather than as one of 55 weak countries. And if I might quickly add, there's been a quick um, article about drug trafficking from Latin America through West Africa. There was a big story recently and they mentioned your neighbor, Guinea-Bissau, but they also said that there might be some involvement in your country. So could you also comment on that, especially whether ECOWAS is talking about how to stop drugs from Latin America passing through the, the Sahel into Europe? Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to start with the second question. We are, as I said, part of the corridor that links Latin America to we know that that corridor is, serves as uh, a way for traffickers, and uh, Cape Verde is part of different mechanisms of international relations, not only with the US, with the Netherlands, with Brazil, with Spain, and we intervene to the extent of our possibilities to impede the the expansion of such traffic. We had several apprehensions that actually seizures by our Coast Guard. So Cape Verde is, is really not uh, a source, but it's actually a corridor. Uh, the Guinea-Bissau being so close, it's a, it's a concern for us. Cape Verde for the fact that is already a neighbor and the fact that has very strong ties with Guinea-Bissau is extremely concerned. Our desire is that Guinea-Bissau becomes um, in, in some becomes normal, so to speak, after its elections, and that the state can become stronger and act in a stronger fashion and fight situations like narco traffic, which is not desirable for any country. And with regards to negotiations in bloc, as a bloc, for some um, supranationals, supranational issues, and I'm talking about free trade agreements, the uh, tra uh, agreement to open up airspace, which is the only one in Africa, those types of agreements um, are negotiated in bloc, but the other the other types of agreements usually are negotiation negotiated on a bilateral level, but it doesn't eliminate what the country needs to protect. For instance, one of the situations that we want to protect is in the financial economic regulation that we need. The, the, all the regulations to be very clear, very transparent, and we also need to define our priorities. So with regards to this issue, I believe that very it, it would be very difficult to negotiate everything as a block. So we have two different realities. We have a supra, um, supranational or extranational capacity and the national domestic issues of each country. The um, Continental Free Trade Agreement is one ratification away for coming into effect. It's an enormous accomplishment, and uh, we're, we're hoping that that will happen very soon. I think uh, Patrick had a question right there. I was originally going to ask the question that he asked about negotiating in groups, so I'll ask something slightly different. I was talking with someone, and I think they summed it up very well that the ability of African countries to make the most effective use of engagement with China, whether it's in terms of jobs creation or, or sound infrastructure, this person felt that it really came down to the quality of governance, you know, that that was 
possibly one of the key indicators as to whether a country would be able to use this in engagement effectively. And it probably applies to many other partner countries. As a country that scores quite well on numerous governance indicators, whether it's doing business or corruption indices, uh, do you think that's true, that it's ultimately the strength of your domestic institutions and governance that allows, will allow you to effectively use your partnerships, whether it's China or France or the US? Uh, repeat, please. Eu estava conversando com alguém. What's the? I think I think you're ten. So uh, I was asking. Okay, okay, it's okay. Okay, it's okay. Okay. So, so Excuse me. Technical difficulties. Excuse me. So this person I was talking to uh, sort of summed it up that the ability for African countries to effectively use Chinese investment and, and financing ultimately came down to the strength of domestic governance, whether it's the ability to fight corruption, the ability to implement sound projects that are uh, wise investments, et cetera, really comes down to domestic institutions and governance. As a country that scores well in terms of corruptions, perceptions, indices, or doing business indicators, do you think that's true for Cape Verde? And, and this will apply to an investment by anyone, whether it's a French oil company or uh, an American tourism company, but uh, do you think that's true, that it's your strength of your governance that will allow you to use these investments effectively? Thank you. And the case of Cape Verde is also a case of other countries with open economy. We need to create good internal con conditions so we can have a good quality and strong institutions and low level of corruption administration that will work there and will assure the best interest of the state. This will sign uh, an environment that will protect global interests for the country. And that's why we have a particular interest and we work with interventions, we attract investments. Today, Cape Verde has investment for so, foreign investments from so many sources and those investments come according to our legislations, our rules, and our intent, as well as our goals for development. To have an open market, it needs to be regulated. And why I'm saying this? I'm saying this because we want to avoid uh, unforeseen circumstances and they will end our economic growth. And in summary, I would like to say that we're trying to preserve the institutions and to say that the laws will work and we can also be attractive for investors, and in, but it needs to be regulated. And that makes us a, a strong country to avoid risks and others unforeseen circumstances for our country. Reader from the Wilson Center, uh, Mike Morrow. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. Here, Mike Witz. Um, uh, there's been a lot of talk here in Washington about competition uh, between the U.S. and China uh, all across Africa. What I'd be interested in hearing from you, sir, is are there areas and issues in Africa where you think the U.S. and China should be cooperating and collaborating, uh, not only for the benefit of Washington and, and benefit of China, but also for the benefit of Africa? W where would you like to see our two countries working together uh, rather than competing? Uh, 
Uh, thank you. We all win. We all we win if globalization will be developed. Globalization, access to market, access to investment, commerce between countries, attract investment, and also free movement of people. And if this becomes easier within the large powers like United States and China, we all will win and it will be a greater win. And for small countries such as Cape Verde, I believe the trade war could be damaged. It could create more difficulties with for transactions. As a small country, our interest is obvious. <laughs> with a world opening, it will be difficult for us to exist. And that's why we're sensitive and we need to be connected. And if we, not, if we don't connect with the rest of the world economy, and if we don't connect between other countries, it will always be difficult for us to develop. And this is our perspective as a country. And that's how we see that the world should be. Commerce should be easier, not only for goods, but also for people. Uh, probably in the next week or two, CSIS will publish a paper on the trade war's effects on Africa. So I think it will augment and uh, enrich some of the comments that you made. Why don't we open up for another round of questions, um, Ambassador Cohen, and then we'll come over here. Uh, Prime Minister, welcome. Uh, thank you for your excellent uh, presentation. Uh, I have a specific business uh, related question. As you know, uh, many African countries have deficits in electric power. And they are now going to the private sector uh, to bring them power. For example, 18 months ago, I cut the ribbon on a private power generation plant in Senegal. Does Cape Verde have a deficit in electric power? And are you willing to accept private ownership? of electric generation. Uh, sim. Uh, nós estamos um processo. Oh yes, we are undergoing privatization. A company, uh, a state company to produce electricity. But this has to be done in a way that we establish obligations and rights and to control what is essential and how public service will be done, we also have to respect the interests of the country. We will grant licensing to produce it and distribute it. We also give some uh, rules that have to be attached uh, in a way that the country will win with privatization. And we have to win with business so we can have greater capability to invest in electricity, something that our state doesn't have the capability to do it. So we have to create partnership between the state and private market. So a country can uh, solve a problem. The problem is how to provide electricity to all. We also have interest in renewable energy. We want uh, to reduce our dependency on fossil fuels. Our goal today is, seven, is that 17% of the energy consumed in Cape Verde should be a renewable uh, energy, such as solar and wind power. And we expect in 2025 20, to be 30% and 2030 to be over 50%. In 2050, we expect to have 100% of uh, electricity from renewable sources. We're a small country and we've been doing so. We started with the state. 
a state will assure with public administration and its constitution to implement so. So we want to combine both electric energy that has the need to continue and also to expand the use of renewable energy. And we also expect foreign investors, private companies that will do so. We expect to give, uh, allow them to work with our state. Thank you, Prime Minister. I'm Max Bone, and I'm a student at the George Washington University. I was actually in Judd's class this fall. Um, I'm curious if you could elaborate on your partnership with Israel that you just mentioned, um, especially if anything has changed since your visit there uh, two weeks ago, and how your cooperation with Israel plays into the various fields, development, trade, and security that you discussed um, <laughs> with the EU, China, and the US. Thank you. So a relationship we we'll define as a strategic relationship between the Triangle, Cape Verde, United States, and Israel. For some reason, Cape Verde has a strong um, alliance with Judaism. It starts in 2000 in the 15th century and then improved in 17th century all the way to 19th century. We also have a, a Jewish inheritance with cemetery, last names. It is a, a, a life presence in Cape Verde. We a country, the Jewish and Christians, we can develop a relationship, a strong relationship with Israel. Israel is an inspiration for us. And that's how we, we can sustain and be resilient. We're a country that doesn't suffer that much. Um, we've been suffering with climate change. We have been having more rain, and we need to solve this problem. And Israel is a great country and a country that can give us a solution for technology transfer. And it can also help us to learn more about irrigation that does not need rain. So we can use rainwater for irrigation and always to produce water and also to improve our use of solar and wind energy so we can reduce two problems, to not depend as much of rainwater and also to use uh, other sources of energy, energy such as solar energy. And we talk about this with the Prime Minister of Israel and also the President of Israel. And I can say we can develop a strong relationship and we can improve a lot. And also everything that's related to technology and to promote it. Israel is much more developed and Cape Verde needs to uh, invest on it. Also, they, we have to learn about public security and city security and also to protect economic zone, maritime zone. And that's how we expect to have a strong relationship with Israel. What changed with our government? Our government has defined clearly that we need to be a strategic partner. We want to have a greater presence in the UN so we can safeguard covert interests. And we don't want to have an anti position to be anti Israel. We need to analyze on a case-by-case case, what is fair and what is common interest for Cape Verde. We also ha have nominated an ambassador that will be in Israel. He's here today with us, Mr. Carlos Vega. He's an uh, ambassador in Washington and also in Israel. And we'll probably open an embassy in Israel. That's why we have a common interest that is very strong and we expect to develop so in the near future. Mr. Sir, uh, my name is Fidel Isie, but uh, I am um, the project manager for uh, Philem as a non-profit. 
Um, in the course of your presentation, you mentioned that your responsibility is to protect uh, the people of your country. And uh, you also mentioned that you've noticed some um, illegal activities. I, I don't know what they are. Would you like to tell us what uh, illegal activities you have noticed among um, international groups that are trying to do business in your country? And uh, what uh, protections have you put in place to, um, to foster those uh, possible illegal, uh, illegalities? And secondly, um, I had an opportunity to talk with your um, uh, first lady, I don't know whether she's still first lady because it's been about four or five years ago uh, at the National Geographic uh, when we had a conference on malaria. And she said, Kivad does not have any problems with, uh, with mosquitoes, uh, with malaria. Is that correct? And um, she also talked about uh, teen pregnancy in your country. Is this still existing or you've taken care of both problems? Thank you. Muito obrigado relativamente à malária e à presença dos. Em relação à malária e em regards to malaria and, and mosquitoes, Cape Verde has reduced this problem. Cape Verde, we don't have problems with malaria. Oh, we do have problems with malaria. We expect by 2020 to eliminate it. The number of cases is very small as a teenage pregnancy is a reality. It's not a great problem, but it does exist. We have so many programs to, to teach and uh, families and a program for, for the youth to avoid <coughs> these unforeseen situations, which is a uh, teenage pregnancy as per illegal activities. As I say, we would like to prepare a country to be a successful country. We need to intervene. We need to create sanctions. We need to use justice in the case of illegal activities. And what can we do? We expect the country to be free of situations uh, and also corruption drug trafficking, and other things that could be negative for our development. So we can have preventive actions when necessary. Questions, so uh, Professor Shin, and then, and then the woman in front of you, and then we'll go to Ambassador Booth. Mr. Prime Minister, you indicated that your favored uh, security partner is the United States. Uh, is there any room for China in your, um, your security interests or policies? And is there any room for cooperation between China and the United States uh, as you look at security concerns that your country has? When we define uh, an interest, it has to do with our lo location. Cape Verde is in it's close to the Americas, is in between the Americas and Africa. So interest in security is in this path. The path that comes from Brazil to the Guinea, and that's where it, it's Cape Verde. And we are in between the African continent. And that's why we define the United States as an ally, a partner, an ally for security. We have common interest, common interest in this zone. We also would like CAPER to be used as a positive element for cooperative security. The country will win with this. And that's why there are that there is a probability and it is a fact that the United States is a great partner. Your Honor, uh, welcome. 
through the Voice of America and president of the Cape Verde Jewish Heritage Project. And we have a couple of our wonderful board members here, Vern Penner and, and Ambassador uh, Herman Cohen. Uh, I'll speak in English. I'm not going to show off my Portuguese It'll be much faster. <laughs> but it's, it's such a, a delight to have you here. And I thought it would be interesting for you to talk about your vision for tourism, because for many years now, tourism has overtaken remittances by the Cape Verdean diaspora in terms of foreign exchange. And because of now your ties uh, with Israel and your appearance yesterday at the APAC, the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee, where you spoke in front of uh, tens of, or at least over 10,000 American Jews, um, there's certainly going to be an interest in perhaps uh, going to the country for its, for its beauty and history, but also perhaps for the Jewish heritage, which our project is in. Um, in the process of helping to restore and preserve with your help as, as the central government and our partners, the local governments. We've been raising money and just to uh, restore and preserve these beautiful cemeteries left by the Moroccan Jews of the 19th century. So in that context, could you talk about your vision for tourism, more airline connections or how you plan perhaps to coordinate uh, all of these uh, sites and welcome perhaps Israelis, Americans, Jew and non-Jew alike. Muito obrigada. Muito obrigado, Cabo Verde. Thank you. Cape Verde is a country whose economy actually is highly reliant on tourism. It's actually over 50% of its GDP. Most of its tourists come from Europe. One third from the United Kingdom. We also have several linkages, but we would like to develop a more diversified tourism. And uh, that goes beyond the sun and beach type of tourism. We would like to develop ecotourism, tourism actually, uh, cultural tourism, scientific interest, and with, re with regard to this aspect, we have two specific interests with the U.S. The Cidade Velha, which is the oldest city of Africa, which was built by Europeans, the most ancient city. And it served as a bridge of relationship between Africa and Latin America and Americas uh, regarding slave trade. But Cidade Velha uh, has a great deal of history with both the African continent and the Americas, especially Brazil and the US. This narrative could be well developed so we could generate history, the, the, those who have a great interest in history, like in Gore in Senegal, that also has the same type of uh, historical reference and could be specifically interesting to Afro-descendants. And then we have Carol, who had been there with us when the rehabilitation of the Varzia Cemetery. When we, great, when we gave great visibility to the tombs, but we have an enormous Judaic presence. And also in Boa Vista, San Anton, we have a small local um, named called synagogue, which actually dates from way back when. And it used to be a point of a meeting point for the Jewish people, not only to exchange comments and opinions and socialize, but also trade and pray. So all of those things could, be, be, could become tourist, touristic attractions. That's what we would like to develop to attract specific thematic uh, tourism on a cultural and historical level. But that's why we need to create more linkages. With the US, we recently privatized uh, an airline with 51% of shares for Icelander. 
and we are going to open new air routes specifically to Washington, D.C. and uh, Boston, and obviously Boston is already there, but also New York. Cape Verde is one of the five countries in Africa that comes has nonstop flights to the U.S. Our own airline has already been doing our country nonstop to Boston for a long time, and we want to link uh, our country with, to Europe and the U.S. through a nonstop, um, a number of nonstop flights which will increase the number of passengers and strengthen our partnership with the U.S. Israel. I know there are several initiatives underway to facilitate the connections between Israel and Brazil. And whoever would go to Israel has to go through Cape Verde. And it could be a great interest to increase these types of connection. We will have direct flights to Lisbon through TAP, the Portuguese airline. We have nonstop flights. Uh, TAP has nonstop flights direct from Lisbon to Cape Verde. So we'll, we intend to have a greater number of tourists, including Israelis. Ambassador Booth. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, my name is Donald Booth. I'm an advisor to the Carter Center. Uh, Ambassador Shin asked half of the question I had for you, so I'll ask the other half. Uh, he asked about security cooperation involving potential cooperation between Cape Verde, the U.S., and China. You mentioned China being a leading uh, partner in terms of infrastructure development and education, I believe. Do you see areas where the United States and China might cooperate jointly with Cape Verde uh, for the development in those areas? China is an old uh, partner. Um, it's not. It's actually the number one uh, partner in infrastructure. But we finance our infrastructure through financing uh, foreign financing programs with favorable conditions from the World Bank, the uh, other uh, institutions, financial institutions. The, the desirable cooperation of all the countries under the conditions that Cape Verde is actually creating to attract more investment. We want to see an economy less and less reliant or dependent on foreign aid. We have been forever dependent on foreign aid. And the evaluation that we came up with is that to remain like this, we would never be self-reliant. So our priority is to attract foreign investments, direct foreign investments, trade, um, the possibility to increase our exports and to use uh, Cape Verde as a, a great tourism destination, digital economy to attract uh, companies to set headquarters there, to actually attract private capital. We intend to have investors from different countries in Cape Verde within the framework I already mentioned with our legal framework that will actually impact all the areas, including financial, etc. So we would welcome all the investments and the maximization of opportunities that actually Cape Verde will be able to develop, particularly in the creation of a, a platform to facilitate greater markets, especially with Western Africa and the rest of the countries. Time and probably have uh, opportunity for just one more question, if there's someone in the audience. Uh, sir, right there. Institute of Peace, thank you, uh, Your Excellency. 
Just getting back to the uh, issue of China, could you address your perceptions on any differences between China and the U.S. business community, how they operate, uh, negotiating contracts, executing contracts? Is there a preferred partner? <laughs> As I said, all investors are very welcome. As long as they are good investments, they want to come up with good business for Cape Verde. Because we actually offer uh, stability, we are very transparent, trust. So if this is actually of interest of U.S. investors, Israelis, Europeans, all fine. But the ideal is to actually be able to get more and more uh, investments for us. This is something very important. Not, it doesn't have anything to do with where they come from, but it's important to have investments for our country to, de to develop. Please join me in thanking uh, His Excellency for joining us today. Thank you. I, I want to give an opportunity for His Excellency if he had any final remarks, and then uh, my colleague Mike Morrell will uh, Mike Morrell will close the uh, event. Oh, I just have to thank you for your attendance here. We are extremely interested in divulging the beauties of Cape Verde in the U.S. For some, given the diaspora that we have, so many people here, we need to have the country best, better known. We want to attract investments and the positive influence that we have. Because of that, we thank you so much for the invitation, and we are at your disposal to actually participate of more sessions like this one. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, for joining us today and for giving us terrific insights on Cape Verde's evolving relations with its international partners. We're very fortunate to have you with us here today, and we thank you for devoting the time to this. I'd also like to thank Judd Devermont and the entire CSIS Africa program along with the National Democratic Institute for partnering with the Wilson Center uh, to co-host this event. Um, Judd, as well as many of the audience members, uh, asked a range of important questions about how Cape Verde is promoting its national interest, while at the same time navigating its relationships with international partners, including the U.S., China, European Union, and others. Uh, there were really six main elements to the Prime Minister's remarks and the questions and answers that emerged that I just wanted to highlight that I think were very, very useful. Um, for one thing, the three themes that we heard uh, very strongly from the Prime Minister is that today Cape Verde stands for globalization, transparency, and good governance. We heard from the Prime Minister that Cape Verde is striding confidently into the 21st century. Cape Verde is open for business, and Cape Verde is ready to embrace the globe, uh, in part by serving as a bridge connecting Africa, North and South America, and Europe. We heard from the Prime Minister that Cape Verde uh, its foreign policy is anchored uh, on a tripod that consists of the USA as the prime partner for security, 
the European Union as the prime partner for trade and investment, and China as the prime partner for economic development, especially in the infrastructure area. We also heard a bit about Cape Verde's growing ties with Israel. With respect to all of those relationships, uh, the Prime Minister emphasized that transparency is key. Uh, he said that Cape Verde knows what it wants and Cape Verde's partners know what Cape Verde expects. Its relationships must be based on trust. And we heard from the Prime Minister that Cape Verde relies on good governance and on Cape Verde's own legal framework in order to protect Cape Verde from any negative practices. Uh, we also heard from the Prime Minister that Cape Verde's various international partners uh, can be most helpful in uh, helping Cape Verde build its capacity to engage in trade negotiations. Uh, we heard that Cape Verde wishes to avoid global trade wars. And in fact, the, the Prime Minister, I thought, made a very eloquent argument uh, against trade wars and, and for greater global connectivity. Um, he emphasized that uh, for countries like Cape Verde, globalization is key, access to markets is key, free movement of people is key, and it's easier for Cape Verde and other smaller countries if the great powers collaborate, because if the great power, powers collaborate, we all win, is what we heard him say. Uh, whereas trade wars um, uh, damage Cape Verde and other countries, damage the global economy, and Cape Verde in particular is, is sensitive to this and feels a need to be connected to the world economy, such as making commerce easier, travel easier, uh, and not making them harder. Uh, I think we can sum up uh, uh, what we heard by, it, there was a clear emphasis from the Prime Minister that Cape Verde is open to working with all partners who are willing to respect its laws. And I thought that was a very strong message. I think we're about out of time now, so uh, like Judd, uh, I ask the audience to please join us again in thanking Prime Minister Correa A. Silva for joining us here today. He provided thoughtful insights on how Cape Verde pursues productive relationships with its varied partners for the benefit of all the citizens of Cape Verde. I also want to give a quick thank you to everyone who helped organize today's event, uh, Ambassador Viega uh, and your team from the Cape Verdean Embassy, uh, also the Prime Minister's office and his team, uh, as well as uh, the National Democratic Institute. Um, also want to thank our, uh, our partnership here with uh, CSIS for organizing and hosting today's event and also want to give a thank you to my Wilson Center team for coordinating with and um, supporting CSIS in hosting this excellent opportunity. Um, the uh, security team asks that all guests please remain seated until we receive confirmation that the Prime Minister has departed the building. So thank you for your patience while the um, security team escorts the Prime Minister from the premises. So again, thank you.